Hi, and welcome to Conversations with B'nai B'rith International. I'm CEO Dan Mariash, and thanks for tuning in today. If you enjoy this series, make sure you subscribe to the B'nai B'rith YouTube channel and like us on Facebook to watch our latest interviews. And of course, visit our website, b'naibrith.org, to learn more about our humanitarian and advocacy efforts across the globe. In a 2021 letter to the editor of the New York Times, Jack Lieger wrote that, quote, the Holocaust is not some vague, far-off memory. Survivors, quote, continue to live with the trauma, and their testimonies include detailed recollections of the horrors they faced, even 75 years later. As president and CEO of the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust, and himself, the son of Holocaust survivors, Klieger understands that the Shoah happened within many of our lifetimes and leads the museum, a living memorial, in its efforts to educate visitors so that never again means never. Now, building upon its mission and its commitment to being a living memorial, the museum is establishing the Peter and Mary Calico Jewish Genealogy Research Center, a new facility where visitors will be able to access the Jewish genealogy resources within Jewish Gen, the museum's wholly owned affiliate, and the world's largest and most significant resource for Jewish genealogy. Visitors to the Calico Genealogy Research Center will have the opportunity to connect with their own heritage and preserve their Jewish family history for future generations. Today, Jack Klieger joins me for a conversation about the Calico Genealogy Research Center and the museum's bold, forward-looking approaches to Jewish genealogy and Holocaust remembrance, as well as what the institution is doing to help educate against and combat rising anti-Semitism. Jack Lieger is president and CEO of the Museum of Jewish Heritage. He was born in Florence, Italy, to Polish and Hungarian Holocaust survivors before emigrating with his family to Brooklyn. He's had an accomplished career in media, including as executive vice president of Condé Nast Publications and Parade Publications, president and CEO of Hachette Filipacci Media U.S., and CEO of TV Guide Magazine, and has been recognized with a Lifetime Achievement Award from the magazine Publishers of America. Jack Klieger was named president and CEO of the Museum of Jewish Heritage in 2019 after 13 years on its board of trustees and oversaw the opening of its groundbreaking exhibitions, Auschwitz, Not Long Ago, Not Far Away, and The Holocaust, What Hate Can Do. Jack, we're pleased to have you here today. Welcome. Thank you, Dan. Pleasure to be here with you. And thank you for that very nice introduction. I I always like to hear something like that and very glad to hear it while I can hear it. So thank well, you. Well, well deserved. Before we delve into the subject of the museum's uh, new project and collaboration with Jewish Gen, uh, tell us a little about the museum um, mm -hmm. relative to Manhattan's other museums. It's, it's yeah. one of the newer ones, although not exactly new. Uh, in your own words, uh, what would you say the mission of the museum is? Well, thank you. That's a that's a very good question and, and one I like to talk about. Uh, the museum was opened 25 years ago in 1997. So we are celebrating our 25th anniversary year this year. Um, it was a project that was long in development from even the 80s. And it was designed by its founding members who included the governor of the state, uh, Mario Cuomo, and the then mayor of the city, Edward Koch, along with a, um, a very uh, strong and committed group of private individuals, including Robert Morgenthau, the, uh, who became the first chairman of the museum, and George Klein, um, and Manfred Orenstein, and Judah Gribitz, among others. The idea was that there was not at that point, and there should be, a living memorial to the Holocaust in this the largest Jewish population city outside of Israel, and one that uh, was not only a major center of diaspora life and Jewish life, but also in a location that faced the Statue of Liberty and Ellis Island to symbolize the opportunity for not only renewal, but for re, 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 rebuilding the Jewish people. However, the two core principles that we started with were remembrance and education. Remembrance of the six million, of those who survived, those who were resilient, and how they rebuilt their lives, and education for current and future generations so that we could indeed never forget and make sure of our promise never again. 
Um, in these 25 years since then, we have not only maintained our original six-sided building facing the river, but added a new wing, the Morgenthau Wing, which tripled our size. We now have over 25,000 feet of exhibition space. We have a number of venues, including one of the finest performing arts uh, centers in this Edmund J. Safra Hall, as well as instead of one exhibition space, we have six. We also have tremendous education facilities and tremendous commitment to teaching um, basically high school students and college students about the history uh, of the Holocaust and the lessons of the Holocaust. Um, if if I can be so bold, whereas we originally were about remembrance and education, as our as we go through a life stage of twenty five years, as the generation of survivors and even their children, as you and I know, are getting older, we feel it's very important to engage not only the third and fourth generations, but now the fifth and sixth generations and their peers to better understand not only who they are, but where they came from and to know their history. Um, I was engaged in getting involved in the museum. I specifically remember um, over uh, 25 years ago when one of my parents' friends, a survivor, sat down and talked to me. He said he was very proud of Survivors always have a communal view of all of the children. He says, we're all very proud of you because you're, you know, you're part of the mishpucha of survivor children. He says, you've done very well, but you know, you have a responsibility. It's not only an honor to be a child of survivors, but a responsibility. And he said, and I'm not as concerned with whether you or your parents or even your daughter knows much about the Holocaust and what happened and the impact of it. I care about your grandchildren's grandchildren. Who will tell the story to them? What will they learn? What will they know? And what will they teach? And that was very impactful to me. It's why I got involved with the museum, um, first as a volunteer, then as a um, working on programs. And then they asked me to join the, the board, uh, as you know, uh, 18 years ago. And then five years ago, uh, I was asked if I would step in on an interim basis, which led, uh, interim has gotten a little longer than interim. But the, the point of it all is, is that we're very committed to education and remembrance, and particularly now when we're entering a stage where we have to foresee not too far out being in a post-survivor world. I want to talk to you more about the, about the mission uh, specifically, but before sure. we do, I, I, don't, I don't want to leave the building without making yeah. a couple of comments. I, uh, I have attended a number of meetings, and, and honestly... Um, there is something very um, um, emotional. I would I would even say breathtaking. The first time you take a look from your, um, I, I want to call it a veranda. It's not really a veranda when, yeah, you, when you look out uh, yeah. onto uh, the Statue of Liberty and Ellis Island. It's 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 quite something. And, and Benabrith also held its uh, 175th anniversary celebration. Uh, at the museum, we're now 180 years old. Um, tell us a little bit more about the appearance of the building, the structure of the building, and how important it is that it makes this architectural statement. Yep. Well, first of all, thank you. And and I want to thank B'nai B'rith for all they do, all they have done and all they continue to do. I have a personal um, family connection. They were very helpful to us in coming over. My mother always speaks very reverentially, as my father did, Oliver Shalom, about the B'nai B'rith. So first, I just want to thank you for all you do. Secondly, about our physical location. We originally started with a six-sided building to represent both the Jewish star and the six million designed by a world-famous architect named Kevin Roche. And that was built and opened in 1997. That faced the river and the statue and Ellis Island. And it was specifically land that was New York state land that was Battery Park City developed, which the governor, Mario Cuomo, made a firm commitment that there would be that location for a memorial in which Mayor Ed Koch was very engaged in bringing that to fruition. So we opened that in 1997. In just four years later, uh, September 11th took place. It was obviously very impactful. We are right close to uh, where the towers were. And in fact, we were fortunate in that our collection, our artifacts, our building was not more severely impacted. 
But our board made a very strong commitment that our plan to expand the museum in the second stage would go forth. And, and so we were the first new construction in Southern New York after September 11th. And in 2003, we opened the Morgenthau Wing, which tripled our space and which includes these dramatic, breathtaking views of the Southern New York Harbor, uh, statue, Ellis Island, Brooklyn Bridge, basically the, the what I call it, the triangle of renewal for uh, immigrants to America. Personally, I will tell you that um, my mother, when she came to visit the first time, obviously proud of what I was doing. She said, after my career and I got this job, she said, you finally have a, a job with dignity. You have to know survivors to know what the humor of that is. But when I, I, I got her a room in the hotel right across the street from the museum, and I got specifically a room which had the, the view of the statue. And when I brought her up to the room and opened the curtain and she looked at it, she started crying. And I said, what, you know, mom, I, I know you. She said, you don't understand when I, the first thing I saw when we came to America as immigrants, as survivors, when you were three years old with nothing to our name but our lives, that's the first thing we saw. And now here I am um, 75 years later, and I'm here in this hotel room, and my son runs the world's third largest Holocaust museum. Well, it's it's touching. And and uh, the, the museum's location, you know, it's urban landscape, uh, I think certainly uh, enhances the message that the museum yeah. conveys. There's no question about it. And um, and it is right that it should be in New York um, because of uh, all of, of our history in this country uh, and the history of, of this country as as a land of immigrants um, and uh, the history of the Jews uh, who came to this country. Tell us about the new installation of the core collection inaugurated last year and how it differs and expands on previous displays. Is the, the 21st century focus on diversity and equity incorporated into the exhibit? And if so, how has the new focus uh, impacted the museum's message? Well, the answer to that is yes. The, the focus on hate and what it can do is broader. Of course, we have a specific, unique aspect of the Holocaust as far as how it affected the Jewish people. But this exhibit called The Holocaust, What Hate Can Do, is comprised almost entirely of artifacts from our collection. And our collection is heavily comprised of artifacts donated by survivors. In fact, of all the museums, we are, I believe, singularly the one with the largest percentage of our collection donated by survivors and their families. It is important for us to show the Holocaust in context, in the context of what Jewish life was before, during, and after, but also in the context of what happened in the world around not only to the Jews. We spent quite a lot of time debating the name of the exhibit. Originally, it was called The Holocaust, What Hate Did. And then we changed it to The Holocaust, What Hate Can Do. Hmm. And that's a very important distinction because it shows that this is not a closed chapter of history, that it's an ongoing chapter in terms of the impact of how hate can start with words, with little actions, with schools with playgrounds, and then evolve into a broader definition and eventually, obviously, the worst definition. But it, it's important in our exhibition to show that there were other groups, gays, gypsies, Roma, um, mixed race, uh, who were impacted and who suffered as well. So we don't do it in a vacuum, in a cocoon. And for us, we think it's very important now to show the modern day effects of being ignorant about history. That's our biggest thing is we don't just fight hate. We fight ignorance. So that so, leads that leads to the, to the next question. And, and that is that the museum hosts tens of thousands of students each year. So how do you use the, the, the rich collections of survivors recorded uh, testimonies to not only teach them about the Holocaust, but to encourage them to think about moral choices and about standing up for yeah. the vulnerable? Because these are generations of young people who are our future. Absolutely. How do, you, how, do you, how do you deal with that? Our approach to the exhibitions and the way we approach it is in storytelling, because kids understand storytelling. 
And so our stories are about the objects in the exhibition and the stories those objects open up. So our main point to the students is to give them specific examples of what happened to individuals and humans. Six million is a very large and hard to comprehend number. But these were individuals, these were people with names who came from places. And we use the objects to tell the story. And the object of the story is the story of the object. And that leads to an understanding of how these were people, all of whom, it's not six million people, it's one person multiplied by six million as to the effect and that there were a million and a half children. And so what happens with any child when they look at something is they start identifying, what would I do in those circumstances? What would have happened to me in those circumstances? How did people survive in their circumstances? And we find that that's a very useful way to connect them to what happened. The interesting thing is that we don't want them to come out of that being afraid. We do want them in a certain way to come out of that being angry and angry in the sense that they know that their people make choices and choices are what make results. And so even at that young age, we want them to understand that they can make a choice and that we want them to, to be not victims, not bystanders, but upstanders for people's rights and for e equal treatment. So we think that the story of the object is the object of the story, and the story of the individual is how we get to have them understand this history. And it's been very uh, successful. As you said, we have roughly 40,000 students coming through the museum. This year, prior to COVID, it was 60, and we hope to get it in the next year or two to 100. Well, what about uh, events and discussions that the museum has held? virtually and in general uh, since the pandemic uh, began. Um, yeah. How have the last uh, three plus years affected how the museum operates? You just talked about the, the numbers and you're, you're getting back the, the numbers of the school children. And how does it see itself um, um, not coping with, but relating to, I guess that would be a better term, to an increasingly digital world with TikTok and Instagram, et cetera? Right. Well, we, we don't use TikTok that much, but we are using Instagram a lot more. But what I will tell you is that during the period prior to the pandemic, even before the pandemic, we it was clear when I got there in 2019 that with generational change, with wanting to have more teens, teens with high schoolers we got, but 20s, 30s, 40s, the grandchildren and great-grandchildren of survivors, we needed to connect to people beyond the walls. So having the advantage of having a tremendous number of artifacts and stories and histories, we aggressively started to develop our digital platforms on Facebook, on email, on um, Instagram, and on YouTube, even before the pandemic. When the pandemic hit and we had to shut our doors for almost two years, we mu moved much more aggressively into that those platforms, with programming, with series, with our educational classes, and with professional development, teaching teachers how to teach the Holocaust, which is a very important thing for us, we, 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 we put it into second, third, and fourth gear. In terms of numbers, for example, the year prior to the pandemic, all together with students and adults, we had about 150 to 200,000 visitors to the museum, with about 10 to 20,000 virtual visitors to our museum and to our programming. Um, this year, we expect to have somewhere, but students and adults, anywhere from 50 to 100,000 and keep building back to that number for physical visitation. But our virtual traffic last year was over a half million oh. interfaces with, with, um, with users and with members what we've seen is a tremendous increase in the number of individual memberships driven by our digital platform. And what you, what started as a physical institution then moved into a digital framework. The word I use with our staff is where the future for us is fidgetal, <laughs> physical and digital. And that hybrid That's of good. the two, as they work together, we make one plus one equal more than two. So for us, it's a, it's a, 
an important model and probably the most impacted model of all of those was within our organization was our was our genealogical website which was an entirely digital business that we will now not only keep expanding digitally the genealogy part of our uh, of our museum but we were all going to add a physical element to a digital start. So on the museum itself, we went, we started physical, we added digital. On our genealogy site, we started digital, we're adding physical. But our future is digital, if so to say. People like that phrase. It's easy to remember. It is. And it's also a very good segue uh, to the new initiative that uh, I spoke about in my introduction. Talk to us about the, the Calico Jewish Genealogy Research Center, how the Calico family became involved in the project. And how does the idea of a genealogy center dovetail with the museum's collections and its installations? Well, I'll I'll start with uh, Mr. Calico, Peter, and his family as being, we, we wouldn't have the Jewish gen in the um, organization if not for the efforts of basically um, our um, chairman, Bruce Ratner, and our vice chairman, Peter Calico. Um, it, 20, more than 20 years ago, Jewish Gen was an existing Jewish genealogical site that found itself in difficult times. The museum took it over, stopped it from going out of business, and kept it going for quite a long time, even if it was costing some money. But about five years ago, it started growing. It was accelerated during COVID. It is now, as you said, the largest genealogy site Jewish genealogy site in the world with over 30 million records. And um, a lot of that is from volunteers and people in Eastern Europe who have painstakingly put together historical data, birth records, death records, marriage records, etc., and translated them. Peter Calico got involved in genealogical research a while ago and was motivated, as was Bruce who also was very involved in genealogical family research, to believe that this was an important element, not only for the current, but for the future, especially here in America, where there are so many um, Jewish people who don't know that much about their family history and don't have that much access to historical records beyond one or two generations. In the past three, five years, as I said, the um, the uh, Jewish Gen has expanded. It's gotten a much greater audience. It's much greater uh, uh, usage by our uh, by our uh, um, uh, volunteers and our by our our customer base. And we also have been working very effectively with organizations like Ancestry.com and um, MyHeritage.com to put the records out to a broader base. You know, it's interesting that um, you know, people of of our generation. Um, I I did listen to the stories that my father told me and my mother told me, so I I knew the uh, the the shtetlach that that they came from. I had I had some place from which to to start, but um, I think that many in our generation um, were doing other things and just didn't listen. Um, I mean, I find that even even in our own family, uh, but that there is a, a lot of interest by young people today. Absolutely, and Absolutely. and I I think that. It, to me, it would seem that the sky is the limit on, on, on this kind of um, a center and this kind of the technology now, which is available to us. Will there be uh, separate databases for Jewish Gen and the museum? Will they merge? Yeah, how will absolutely. You, how will We've always kept the databases and the website separately. We're now, you know, saying that you know, own, you know, an affiliate of um, of the museum. We have fully incorporated Jewish Gen, so it's. Um, a, a one legal entity, but absolutely a separate brand and a separate database and a separate website. We Will don't there mind. Be... The yeah, go ahead. We don't go mind ahead. mixing the two. We don't mind having a. We want to have a physical place so that every of one of our physical visitors will know they can drop in and find out more about their family history. I want to take a moment to talk about one specific project I'm very proud of of what Jewish Gen has done. Um, Yisker books are something you might be familiar with. There were 1,500 or 1,200 to 1,500 Yisker books published after the Holocaust, which were small communities that recorded their history. Many of them no longer there, as we and I were talking. There are villages that are gone. 
they were all in the original language, either Polish or Lithuanian or Hungarian or Russian, as well as potentially in Yiddish, but they were not in English. Tw over 10 years ago, Jewish Gen started translating Yisker books from these areas into English. A uh, lot of money for each one. It costs hundreds of thousands of dollars to translate one book because it has to be put painstakingly in English research. Over the past 10 years, we have translated over 250 Yisker books into English and made them available online. And Yad Vashem has a full set. And when we open the Calico Center, we will have a full library of these Yisker books, as well as having them all loaded up online so that anybody can come in and look up their family history and oftentimes find the story of the town their family came from that's no longer there. So um, we're very proud of that. We're going to expand it. And we will have this center because for us, for American Jews, it's very important to know not only who you are, but where you came from. And what you said now about people being very interested now, I'm reminded of what Rabbi Jonathan Sachs of, of the UK, the chief rabbi of the UK of blessed memory, once said, and it was absolutely right, and that was that the Holocaust generation, they first focused on rebuilding. Survivors focused on rebuilding. And then they started remembering. It was very sequential. I asked my mother that. I said, Mom, did you ever feel like that? She said, you know, I never thought of it that way, but you're absolutely right. That is how many survivors felt. So the remembrance part came later. And here in the U.S. and also in Israel, the descendants of survivors and the descendants of Jews who came over even earlier, they have a great interest, but they don't necessarily have a lot of information. Obviously, Jews were somewhat different. They weren't citizens of any particular country first. Many of them didn't even have last names until the 1800s. So the researching of that information based on spelling, based on translation, based on history, is a very complex and time-consuming deal. But we have built a very good database and framework, and we're making it, we hope, even easier to do research. But we think a physical center where every visitor of the museum knows they can come in and start the process or enhance the process, look at one of the Isker books and look up their family name in Drovna or Dubna or Lithuania, wherever. We think that'll be a great tool and we're very excited about it. Also, we have, as I said, 40 to 50,000 students, more coming. We are going to open another exhibit in October about rescue about the Danish rescue and actually make an exhibit for nine to 12 year olds. We have up until this point only uh, had students from 12 and above, but now we're gonna have fourth, fifth and uh, sixth graders and seventh graders. And we think that the resource center, the Calico Center will be very useful when we engage with all of these young people and then they wanna find out more if they do. That's not, I mean, Obviously, not all of our visitors are Jewish, but we want to make it easier to find out more about your history. And we think it's particularly important in the United States, where sometimes people don't know what happened beyond two, three, four generations. But there's a tremendous interest in knowing that uh, that family history. Yeah, I know it's the uh, I think the 80th anniversary of the rescue of Danish Jewry. So that that's October. certainly uh, that's a program that, that we'll be looking forward to. Do you expect a lot of. Um, Folks who come to the museum will be able to use uh, the, um, I, I assume, uh, the, the, the database and the computers and so forth. What about research? What about scholarly researchers, academics? Do you expect a lot of that as well? I, be, I be, We already have, and we can expect that to continue because we will have connection to our uh, researchers, and we have many of them in various parts of the world, but we will have connections to our researchers by country. So if you want to look up your family's history in Lithuania or you want to look up your family's history in Poland or even Greece, uh, we will have not only access to the materials, but we will have assistance both from staffers who can help you figure out how to use it, but also access to researchers um, to help get guidance that way. But we do think it can become an academic center for research as well. What's the timeline for getting all of this done? People will anticipate. Um... I'm sure making their way over uh, to uh, to try it out. Um, what's your timeline in terms of uh, construction and planning? How will how will that go forward? 
We have the space identified. Um, we have named it. We uh, will start construction on it shortly. We hope to have it ready by June, July, um, maybe earlier, but we definitely want to have it ready by the time uh, we get to uh, June, July. It's a nice size space on the main floor, about 400 square feet. We'll have terminals where people can use their the, the, our databases. We'll have a library of Yisker books, and we'll have um, um, computers that people can 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 access as well. So uh, we'll have a pretty good facility uh, with staff there, and I think we'll be open, you know, by June, July. Yeah, you know, I think really uh, we're so fortunate uh, in our time to be living in a time uh, when um, such um, an opportunity uh, to, um, to to dig deeply and to um, find out uh, where our roots are and roots r o o t s and r o u t s uh yeah. in terms of, of title, where, I like where, okay it's all it's all yours where 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 it all came from where where did we come from so yeah. i think it's it's really exciting but let me ask a broader question this would be final question jack um but but maybe um i guess the um, maybe the most important um as we talk about the museum itself um what do you hope visitors of all ages will take away from from being there, from immersing themselves in the exhibits like the Holocaust, what hate can do, um, being in in inside an institution which is devoted to our past and also to very much to our present and to our future. So, what's the what's the takeaway message? Well, I think I think I want every generation, future, current, and future generations to understand not only what what hate can do but that you have a responsibility to be engaged and to fight against hate in every form um we as a people should know as well as anybody what equality and opportunity can mean we say it in all of our prayers and we always acknowledge that until all are free none are free this institution is dedicated to understanding history and learning from history and applying the lessons to the future. So I think if we can, and, and obviously we live in a time where so much more access to ignorance and bad information exists, and we have to fight that with good information. But at the end of the day, to me, the most important mission is what I talk to our survivors about, who are our North Star and who I and I meet with on a regular basis, and I and I tell each one of them, I make a pledge that they should know that uh, there will always be a place here in New York where their grandchildren's grandchildren will have a place to come to learn and to teach. And I take that responsibility on very strongly. So it's a, a it's it's both a responsibility but a promise. Well, it's a great way to close this conversation. To learn more about the upcoming Calico Jewish Genealogy Research Center and the museum's critical work educating visitors about Jewish life before, during, and after the Holocaust, head to mjhnyc.org. Jack Klieger, the work that the museum is doing is not only uh, never forget the Holocaust, but also to promote understanding of Jewish heritage, their invaluable contributions to help create a more tolerant world. We really appreciate your being with us today. Wishing you and the museum nothing but success in building the research center. We'll be excited to see it when it opens. And thank you, Dan, and thank you to the B'nai B'rith for all you have done, all you do, and all you will continue to do. Well, thank you again to Jack Klieger and to you for watching this conversation with B'nai B'rith. Now, if you enjoyed this interview, subscribe to the B'nai B'rith YouTube channel and like us on Facebook for all of our latest content. And be sure to visit our website, benebrith.org, to learn more about our important work. For my guest, Jack Klieger, I'm Dan Mariaschen. Join us again soon.